Should, he should have already had those. I'm sorry, I forgot to give it to him. So, uh, so today we get to talk about preteens, maybe 10, 11, 12. Got anybody 10? Are you 10 yet? That's how you're, you're 10. And uh, let me see here, all the way up to preteens. We got one up there getting involved right now. Uh, we got, uh, uh, or that, she's 10 would be preteen as well. And then we don't have anything. Uh, we have we have Sharice is a, is a upper teen right there and and uh, but anyway some are going to be that they're going to go through that stage so we have all these different stages we want to consider those and talk about their area of life that they're in and then also just how we as a church you know what is our responsibility how can we minister to them help them as you get your paper there uh, if you need a pen raise your hand somebody can help you out a couple people need pens there. And so your first blank is just by way of review. The infant to toddler stage, you know, that really early age of development is a time of receiving. We hand everything down to them. We give to them. They're very needy. They depend on what we give them. They're receiving age. And then you have young children. Okay, They're learning some things. They're realizing. It's a time of realizing. They're learning how things are. They're learning how the world works, realizing certain things hurt. You know, if they do them, uh, they discover what it feels like to get burnt with fire because it looks so tempting to touch that uh, that candle. You know, and uh, I don't know how, how, how far that goes. They learn what it feels like to stick a key in the lights uh, in the uh, electrical outlet. And that no, don't <laughs> don't let them go that far. OK, but uh, but they're, they're learning how this world works. They're learning some things hurt. They're learning, hey, if I talk back to mom and dad, I get spanked. Right. That's something they got to learn at an early age. And uh, all these kinds of things are learning. It's a time of realizing, a time of preteens now. Preteens and early teens is what we're going to talk about today. It's a time of rejecting. Now, that sounds bad. And it can be bad for sure. But this is a time where they start realizing, hey, I'm learning a lot of stuff. I know that not everybody's perfect. I know mom and dad aren't perfect. They don't have everything figured out. And so they want to start challenging that. They want to start rejecting some of the things you teach them and some of the things that they uh, you tell them there's actually something healthy in that and that they're trying to reason out for themselves what they believe. But obviously we know that can be a real danger. We'll talk about that tonight. And then finally, late teens into early adulthood is a time of representing. Right. Guys going to go off and be the head of their own house and uh, women also uh, working uh, along with their husband or, or under their parents, whatever, whatever they're doing in that stage of life. Uh, they're going to represent the family, and you just hope at that point everything you taught them has stuck, and uh, you train a child the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. So we move on to number three here. This is preteens and early teens, a time of rejecting. At this point, the children have gained a lot of knowledge. They think they know a lot more than they do, but they've gained a lot of knowledge. And if you're in that age group, I am not trying to tear you down, make fun of you, because I was at that stage. I remember what it was like, and it's a time. And see, here's one of the good things, again, about Jesus going through these times of development. Like I said, yeah, he understands. Now, he was without sin. We understand that he never sinned, but he knows what it feels like. Do you ever think about that? Like, like, like I don't, I'm not making light of this, but Jesus had to go through puberty. His voice probably had to change. He had to feel... Uh, uh, what the different hormones and emotions and chemical changes that guys go through. I'm just assuming that he had to go through all that like everybody does. He knew what it felt like, all right? But he was able to set the perfect example and to go through that. Look, this is part of it. Now, here's a thing to always remember. Young kids, remember this. Your parents have already been through what you've both gone through. They understand it to some degree, all right? You think, oh, they don't know what it feels like. You just don't know what it's like. You know, to have parents doing this and that. Yeah, we've all gone through that stage of life. We know what the hormones are like. We know what that feels like to think you know more than mom and dad, right? But that's just something that we have to we have to go through. And and then uh, once we re reach adulthood, obviously, uh, we realize we really don't know anything. <laughs> all right, maybe it's just me. All right, so number one, Jesus, as we read there in verse 42... Let's go ahead and read it again. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. 
and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Now, Jesus does have an edge over them on this, all right? Kids, stay up with your parents. Don't leave them, don't let them leave you behind in the temple, okay? But they, supposing him to have been in the, co in the company, when a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors. All right. These are the doctors of the law, the people that understood the Bible. And, and they had a great intelligence, right? Both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So think about this. Somebody... You know, 12 years old, a little older than Natalia, a little bit younger than Braden, somewhere in the middle there. And this is Jesus sitting in the temple, right, reasoning with the doctors of the law. I mean, the can you imagine somebody's been through all the training? They sat under, you know, great uh, teachers like Gamaliel and all these, you know, wise people. They sat under that. They got all the Bible teaching. They got instruction on all the things. I mean, the the. Uh, those guys, the rabbis in that time, they knew a lot more than just, you know, I know the Bible pretty well. They are supposed to be educated in all these different things. And here he is sitting down reasoning with them and asking them questions. Can you imagine? I mean, most 12-year-old boys, I mean, come on. I just want to go out and play. <laughs> you know, somebody's reading. I hated lectures. All right. Now, different kids learn differently. You kind of have to know your kids and know how they learn. Some kids, especially boys, like the best way for them to learn, they actually have to do it, right? There's right. kids that have to, they, they need to know how things work and they and they have to handle it with their hands and they have to see how it works. I would say probably very few boys are just sit in a school type situation where somebody gets up and lectures and, and I'll forget that, man. When I was a kid, I'm looking out the window, I'm thinking, yep. you know, man, I you know, wonder if it's gonna rain. I really wanna play baseball, you know, I don't wanna really play, actually I like playing in the rain, but. You understand, that's a boy's, 12-year-old boy's typical thinking. How many kids you know, they're sitting, 12 years old, sitting there and reasoning with the, the doctors, you know, of the, you know, doctor of divinity, <laughs> sitting down and talking with them and saying, really? Because, you know, if you go back to Leviticus, what you find is, I mean, you just don't really see that. And so I'm not saying that we ought to be exactly like Jesus in that way. But young people, what you need to understand, when you're preteens, You've already gone through this stuff we talked about last week, and now you are preparing for adulthood, right? I know you still got another uh, phase of life to go through, but you should be learning some things. Now, how many of you heard of these child prodigies? They still have. I mean, they're still around. There are kids at a very young age who can just blow your mind with their maybe mathematical abilities and knowledge. And you're just like, ah, oh, does that kid understand all this? Or this science, uh, uh, different things. A lot of them, musicians, uh, uh, mathematicians, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I was looking into musicians. Anybody know how old Beethoven was whenever he wrote a uh, uh, his first symphony? <clears throat> no, uh, you got Mozart in mind. I was going to say that next. Beethoven was 12 years old. 12 years old. And he wrote his first symphony. I'm talking about like people will like marvel at it to this day. Like they would listen to it and say, man, that was, he, this kid's a genius. Uh, Mozart started writing such symphonies whenever he was seven years old. And, uh, and and there are still people like that today. They just they just are masters of things. I was reading this. Some of them are a little less known. You know, we don't understand. We, we just don't keep up on this type of thing probably. But there are some guys who were geniuses. Who, uh, one guy got the Nobel Prize. I can't think of his name, but he studied like, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, I can't what it's called. <laughs> this just shows you I wasn't a childhood prodigy. What's it called? Uh, I don't want to say nuclear fission, but but like, uh, what is it, the energy that you get from, I don't know, anyway. Some, it's not about how all that works. He was a, he was a, a genius in those kinds of things, nuclear mm -hmm. physicist of some sort. I don't know what he studied. Exactly. And I was reading that he was really, really young. And he was like writing these like major papers that people were studying saying, wow, how does he know all this stuff at a very young age? Why is it hard for me to fathom that? I told you when I was 12 years old, all I wanted to think about was baseball. Right. And art. You know what I was drawing at 12 years old? I was drawing comic book characters. Right. I just wanted to be able to draw these things. And, and uh, you know, I thought it was cool. Watch cartoons, play video games. And I thought that was neat. Look, 
you learn some things. I learned how to draw. I learned how to do various things at that age. But I was interested what I wanted to be interested in. And uh, some other things, you know, that didn't interest me that much. So this is an age in the preteen, early teens. They're learning what it is they're interested. First of all, what are they interested in? You know, it's kind of good as a parent to be able to recognize that. Hey, I don't think you know, he's going to go that direction. Right. Let's maybe I could maybe he's interested in these kinds of things, uh, you know, and then sometimes you kind of force them into it. We don't you, you want to be careful about that. But this is an important time of their life where they're finding this stuff out. Okay, In the Bible, most kings started reigning when they were 30 to 40 years old. King David started reigning whenever he was 30 and he reigned for 40 years. But, you know, there were some kings that were much younger than that. Look at look at. Uh, oh, let's. Uh, yeah, let's go there. Second Kings chapter 11. Second Kings chapter 11. And look at verse 21. Seven years old was Jehoash or Joash uh, in Chronicles. When he began to reign, here's a man that took the kingdom. He took the reign at seven years old. Who we got seven years old? One of these guys, seven. Uh, Reuben, seven years old. Seven years old. There's your king. <laughs> Put a crown on this man. He's going to make the decisions, you know, for the rest of the king. Now, I will say this. It mentions his mom, okay? His mom was his advisor. There you go. Now we're moving up a little bit. This is Steve. He's going uh, to help him out in ruling the kingdom. All right, but this is what you have. And then uh, in 2 Kings 22, 1. Josiah, eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. Seven year old, eight year old. I was rare. Usually they're in the 30s or something like that. But for whatever reason, this man was destined, these kids were destined to be the king, so they put him in charge. Hey, you read about Josiah? He was a good king, <laughs> right? He was able to do that. And you think, I got a feeling he wasn't like your average eight-year-old, <laughs> right? He probably was concerned about things, maybe sitting in, reasoning with some people and understanding how politics works and everything. I don't know. I'm just assuming as you read the Bible uh, that he was concerned about things and then he's concerned about the things of the Lord as well all right and uh at, so from 10 to 12 somewhere around those those years uh these children began seeking the truth and they realized that there's a lot of error out there okay they began to understand how these things work uh and, and that you know man i didn't realize it you know it works the way i didn't realize that people are that way uh, we began learning technology. I've been, I've been waiting to share this illustration for a long time. I like giving stories about Braden. He's the funnest one to pick on. <laughs> oh, I could share some more that would be more embarrassing, but let me just share one. more. Share one. You're learning new tech, uh, uh, terminology, all right? And actually, he was a lot younger than this, but I just thought it was funny. <laughs> He's sitting down at home, and Valerie looks at him, and he's sitting on her lap, and he says, Braden, give Mommy a smackaroo. Now, who knows what a smackaroo is? She's asking for a kiss, right? Give mommy a smackaroo. He's like, no. What did you say? No, mommy, give me a smackaroo. He said, no. She's like, Braden Richard, I don't want to have to give you a spanking for this. I told you to do something, not do it. Give mommy a smackaroo. And he goes, <laughs> And we realized it wasn't his fault. He just didn't know what, at least he says, he didn't know what a snapper was. All right. That's how they learn. They're learning what these different things are. Like I said, I can share a whole lot of stories, but as you get older, you're learning, okay? But now you're 10, 12 years old. Look, you figured out what that means. You figured out, hey, no matter what, mommy would never ask me to smack her in the face, okay? I'm never going to do that. You begin learning at 10, 12 years old, at least how these things work. And way more than that, right? But you also, by this time, you've made a lot of bad mistakes. Uh, you've learned, uh, you know, I, I remember one, at that age, at Braden's age, 
if I uh, made a big mistake, right? I wanted so badly to get my parents' trust and for them to think I was growing up and I was mature and everything. And if I made a big mistake and I was gotten to trouble, uh, whether I just did something wrong, I don't know, maybe uh, cheated on my test or something like that, got caught. Anybody ever know a kid? You said, brother, brother Rocky, you would ever do that? You ever know anybody that like, man, I don't want my parents to see my report card, so they like changed the grade or something like that, right? And you think, oh, I can get by with it because you, you're, you're not really as smart as you think you are at that age. And then you go and you get in trouble, and then it's like, man, my parents are never going to trust me again. I don't know if you had that relationship with your parents, but me, I was like, I don't want my parents to never trust me again. You know, and you just live with that. But you know what? Those kinds of things make you better. Like you made the mistakes. Now you learn from it. And say, I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to try to, you know, uh, uh, correct those things. Look, pivotal time in your life. Because here's the thing. You could say, well, I'll wait till later on in my life and then I'll start getting smarter. I'll wait till a certain point in my life and then I'll start figuring out what career I'm going to have. I'll wait till a certain point in my life. Then I'll start serving the Lord. Yeah, but you know what's going to happen? You're going to get to that point and you make all these mistakes in your life. It's great if you actually do start serving the Lord. And even if you have all that baggage in your past, but you know what? It would have been so much better if you didn't have that baggage in your past. Right. If you didn't make those mistakes. Amen. Right. So 12 years old, 13, 14. I mean, you're, these are pivotal times in your life where you decide, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to start going the right direction and growing and learning how to be more effective uh, for the Lord and, and uh, you know, prepare for my future, all that. But a lot of bad mistakes are made. But at the same time, you know, that's a change that they're going through. You know, young kids, uh, I'm doing marriage counseling right now. And uh, in this, we were talking, I was talking to this, uh, I mean, I'm not, we're not in marriage counseling. <laughs> I'm counseling a couple that's about to get married. And uh, we were talking, I mean, they're in their 20s, right? Uh, and we we're talking about how it's natural part of the process. Men growing up, learning how to do these things. They have different desires, you know. Uh, they will go through a stage where they want to be tough, and maybe they learn martial arts, or, or uh, for me, it was boxing. You know, for him, it's MMA. You know, just these. Des- there's different things going through their mind. I need to be a man. You know, I'm, I'm starting to get facial hair. I'm starting to go through different changes. My voice is getting deeper, and they're ready to be a man. And that continues sometimes up until your 20s, right? I'm, I'm jumping ahead because that's the next section we're going to talk about. Sometimes that continues on, but imagine if you get that settled in your preteens. And in your teenage years, your final years, finishing school and, uh, and learning, uh, uh, you know, what career you're going to go through and all that. Imagine if you actually just got settled down and got these things figured out and said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get distracted you know, this guy was talking about how he went off to college and there was party atmosphere. Everyone was drinking and doing all that stuff. And he went down that road. He had to go through that, come back out of that. And now he's like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that and messed up that part of my life and made all those mistakes. Now I want to go forward. And imagine that before he went off to college, he actually went to college for the right reasons, you right. know, and said, I'm going to get this thing down and I'm going to stay focused. I'm not going to get pivotal times. Again, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead because I'm supposed to be talking about preteens. But that is true. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I love this chapter of the Bible. A few weeks ago, some of us were sitting around fellowship and we were talking about this chapter. And it's talking about the evil days. All right. It describes what it's like after a person gets to a certain age. I'm right on the edge of that, I think. Some of these things are starting to be uh, an issue for me. He's talking about the evil days when the sun uh, and the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds, this is verse 32, by the way, uh, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, probably talking about teeth right there, and those that look out the window uh, be darkened, you know, maybe talk about they're losing their eyesight, and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and and uh, he shall rise up with the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Uh, it's just describing what somebody's going to go through. Uh, you know, it talks about the almond tree shall flourish, probably talking about the gray hair right there. And, and all these men, we're all going to get old if, we're, if we continue to live. If God allows us to continue to live, we're going to get old. And there's going to be a day where we sit in our old age and think, man, I sure wish I would have done more for the Lord. 
Amen. Probably not going to say, I wish I would have played another video game. <laughs> I wish I would have, you know, picked up one more bad habit or something like that. No, we're going to wish, man, I wish I would have done more for the Lord. Right. Like, I got people, well, you, you've been to Iola. We got a lot of older folks in Iola. And we've got people that say, I look back on my life and say, why did I waste so much time? I wish I would have yeah. done more for the Lord. Amen. So the time is at your preteens when you're starting to figure things out in this life. And that's your time where you start saying, hey, I need to set my direction straight. Mommy and daddy can't always do it for me. I need to focus on the right kinds of things. Because here's what it says in verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Look, you are fixing, you know, I'm thinking about Burden's age right now. He's getting stronger, smarter. He's, he's fixing going to his prime years, you know, his, his upper teen years, and then maybe even into his early 20s. He's going to be the fastest. He can, I'll never be able to run as fast as I could in my 20s, right? It's just not going to happen. I'm, I'm beyond that now. And so you're looking ahead at a preteen. You're looking ahead at those days when you're going to be at your prime. You're going to be the smartest, the most uh, creative, right? You're going to be able to think clearly and not forget your, uh, your memories and your thoughts and all that. Man, that's when you want to be fully, you know, prepared to do what God's given you to do, okay? The earlier one begins seeking the Lord, the better. I feel like, I feel like most of my childhood, I had a desire for the Lord. But looking back, man, I could have done so much more, read my Bible more, memorized scripture more, done more soul winning. Uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of stuff I could have cut out of my life so that I could have been more serious about serving the Lord. All right, this is where someone will decide. Am I going to begin seeking the truth? Or am I going to start escaping uh, from this life that my parents have forced me to have that I don't want anymore? And you can almost see it. They reach the age of just rebellion, and you just hope and pray, God, help me. I've done what I can to get this out of that person. Uh, I'm out of this child. But they get to that point where they could say, you know what? When I'm old and I'm grown and I'm making my own decisions, I'm not going to do what's been forced upon me. Well, that's a bad decision to make. You're going to have to learn things on your own as a child, but they're going to have to uh, make that decision to follow the Lord and make the right decisions. All right. C. So here are some ways we can help. Uh, to some degree as a church, because we've already talked about how we, it's the parent's responsibility, and then ultimately rest on the child. So it's really not going to help us to say, well, let's just take them over to this other class where we can sing songs and play games or try to figure out, you know, one thing, one reason that's bad, I'll tell you why. Because you get every 12-year-old into a class, that, and you have to make all of them happy and get them all on the same page. I tell you what, those kids who love the Lord and maybe have the potential to do more for the Lord, it's not like they're going to bring all of the class with them. I've watched it. It doesn't work that way. It's not going to be like, hey, I mean, you get some very, very rare exceptions, but you're typically not going to get a 12, 13-year-old that's going to say, come on, guys, let's go win some souls. Come on, guys, let's read our Bibles. Let's do No, usually what's going to happen is you get this class, you're going to have some of those bad kids that get in there or some kids that haven't been trained for the Lord. And these kids are at an age, remember, where they're trying to figure things out in life. They're trying to be accepted. They're trying to find out which way they're going to go. Now they're looking at these kids that have been allowed to do things that they were never allowed to do. And they're saying, I wonder what that's like. And it almost always happens the bad. It's kind of like the bad apple example. They talk about the bad apple. What does it do? It ruins the whole bunch, right? Because they start, like, affecting everybody else. So this is not what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to let the parents, uh, you know, uh, have the main instruction on them, but here's some things that we can do as a church for people, uh, for young people that age. They aren't yet adults, though they might start feeling like they're more uh, adults and want to be adults. I believe this is a good point. They can a uh, good point in their life where they can really begin being included into the church group and little activities or, and responsibilities can uh, they can be part of and they can do. It. Taking up offering, for instance, it's a great thing for them to do. Finding little jobs like this that we can incorporate them to, we should probably figure out how to do that more. They can be called on to pray, you know, during different different things. They can be involved in practice preaching at this age, practice song leading. They can start uh, 
uh, on soul winning, they can learn to step up, start doing the talking, right? It's important for them to start learning these things. They can help with things around the church, mowing, cleaning, uh, organizing things. This is the ideal age. Now, here's an interesting thing, though. That childhood age where there are, uh, what was the R for the, for the young child? Re where they're realizing, discovering new things. Guess what? At that age, they like being a helper. Hey, you want to do the dishes? Yeah, I can't wait to do the dishes. That's new, right? They're wanting to learn how to do these things. When they get to preteen age, it's like, hey, you want to mow the grass? Oh. <laughs> All of a sudden, like, I know how that works. I know that gets boring. I know that's not fun, right? But that's when they that's when it's most important for them to start doing it so they can begin developing habits and all that. So I would like to think about, you know, some ways that we can incorporate our young people uh, doing some of these things as we look towards the future. I think this would be great for them. OK, now let's talk about older teens, older teens and young adults. Hey, if you're in your early 20s, I say you could even, you would even fit into this category. You're already out on your own, maybe making your own decisions and all that, but still um, your own house. Uh, you're looking forward to that time of your life. And so you are already learning, if you haven't already learned, how to become a leader. All right. Up until this point, maybe early teens, uh, somewhere around, you know, Brayden's age, and just using him for an example uh, of a point of reference. Somewhere around that age, things start changing. Up until this point, you know what? I found, and I was talking about this in the marriage counseling yesterday, I found that a lot of girls surpass the boys at this age. They do better in school. Not always, but, you know, you always, there's always a handful of, kid, of, of boys uh, that are really smart and all this kind of stuff. But oftentimes, you look at a rule, on a, as a rule of thumb, you look a lot of this time up until this age, Girls have been able to outwit the boys. Sometimes they're motherly, they have motherly instincts, and they even kind of boss the boys around, and they're leading the boys, right? Am I right on that? Some of them can even beat up the boys, let's be honest. I'm not going to ask Natalia to, to, to agree with me or not agree with me. She could probably beat up boys her age. <laughs> <laughs> her brother's disagrees. <laughs> At this age in school, even up until Braden's age. Boys and girls, you probably you might even know this, in public school are wrestling against each other. Co-ed wrestling. I, I hate it. All right. I, I despise that thought. But technically, at that age, they can probably handle their own. So boys can probably throw girls can probably throw some of the boys around. At this age, it would be a very rare exception, right? That a kid, a guy is entering into adulthood. And some girl can push him around and beat him up and, and all that stuff. It shouldn't be that way. By now, they should have learned how they should have gotten stronger just naturally, but then also learned how to work, learned how to lift heavy things, you know, learn how to uh, uh, educate themselves and know how things work and be a little smarter so that they can lead the women. Isn't that what God designed? Right? So somehow you get into a relationship, they people enter into marriage. And guys are like still looking to the women like they were whenever they were eight, nine, ten years old. And the woman is like bossing the guy around and the, and the kid and the guy still being immature and and and, uh, and he's not taking responsibility. I've known ladies that are working two, three jobs while the guy stays at home and is not doing anything. And it's like, oh, oh Andy, you, somewhere around the line, you stop growing because by the time you reach uh, to this age, you should be ready to be the head of the household and to be a leader. Now, look, I don't care if the world calls that toxic masculinity or whatever they're going to call it. This is what God designed. Now, you don't have to be ugly about it because part of being a leader and having authority is learning responsibility too, right? And so if you're a good leader, you're not just going to be ugly to the people that you're leading. No, you've learned how to help lead them and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, uh, just because you're the leader doesn't mean that you are just walking all over those people who you're leading. But look, at the time you're a teenager or a late teens, early uh, adulthood, so you maybe up to even up to your 20s, uh, by the time you're there, it is time for you to represent yourself and represent the Lord and represent your family, all these things, okay? By now, they should have sorted through a lot of things in their minds. 
They've made a lot of mistakes, no doubt about that. Hopefully they have uh, made those mistakes earlier on. Like I said, not like going through college and everything saying, woohoo, out of the house now, party, you know, and just totally just messed up their lives. But hopefully they've been able to uh, make those mistakes, learn from them. And now they have reached adulthood. They're smarter. They're ready to take on the responsibility and leave the house. It's only at this time that they can begin successfully representing themselves and hopefully, hopefully their family name and establishing their career and or ministries. And for the parents and other adults, as hard as it is, this is the time where they need to let these young adults grow. Let them leave the house. I was talking about here recently about eagles and how eagles, the Bible even talks about this, how they actually stir up the nest, right? And what they're basically doing is they're pushing that eagle out of the nest and saying, you need to learn how to fly. What happens whenever that eagle gets pushed out of the nest? It, I mean, the nest, it flaps its wings, but you know, it's just going. And that mother eagle goes down there, swoops up underneath it, lifts it up. And this Bible talks about, I lifted you up on eagle's wings, right? Lifts it up into the sky and then lets it go again. <laughs> Flies down until eventually it gets it. I'll say that's kind of how I learned how to swim. I was on a military base, right? I said, all right, they're going to teach me how to swim. I'm sitting there waiting for some instructions, and they say, <laughs> they threw me in the water, said, swim to the other side, right? That's maybe not the best way to teach somebody how to swim, okay? But that's how I did it. And then, they, you know, if I was going to drown, which I didn't, they would have jumped in and helped me. Look, sometimes it's sink or swim. Get to a certain age, you're on your own, but you can't any longer say, well, it's not fair. My parents haven't, you know, showed me what to do next. Well, it's all up to you now, buddy. <laughs> you know, you are got to figure it out. Well, I just don't know this responsibility. I don't know how to do this. Well, you better figure it out. Thankfully, we're in a generation of YouTube. You can figure out how to fix your car on YouTube, fix your house on YouTube. <laughs> but you're going to have to figure it out, and you're going to have to learn how to get some bad things out of your life, too. Uh, you, know, you should be responsible at this point to do that. So parents and adults, we need to be able to let them do that. Be patient with them. Remember whenever we were young and trying to figure those things out on their own. All right, so how does the church help with this? Well, begin treating them like adults, right? We don't have to have a young, we don't have to have a teen ministry and then like a, 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 a college age, college and career ministry. I mean, I'm not saying that people are necessarily wrong for having these. I'm just saying you don't need that. You don't have to have a, a young couple's uh, a ministry. and then a, Now, look, there's times where these groups of people need the fellowship because they can speak each other's languages and I understand that people that are raising kids, you know, it's good for them to do things together so they have that in common or whatever. But here's what a teenager or, or late teens, early adult, here's what they need to do. Be adults. Right? Amen. Understand what preaching is like. Know how to read your Bible. Know how to do all these things. You're an adult now. Be an adult. Amen. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Look, some people have made that too strict of a... Hey, that means they would. If you train them right, they will. Like, I understand there's exceptions. You know, there are times people may, for whatever reason, you know, maybe at a young age, they became reprobate and rejected the Lord or whatever. I don't know what, this, what, what the point would be. But here's a general rule of thumb. If you trained them up, you should be able to say, well, I've trained them. I've taught them everything that they need to do. Now they should be able to just, you know, keep that up. Uh, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Right, we had to set them in motion to begin with. Now look at Psalm 127, great chapter. I'll read the whole thing short. Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh uh, wake but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Here's a part I want you to notice. 
As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Every time a child is born, that's just another opportunity for them to accomplish something great for the Lord. You know, there's some things I'll never be able to do again, quite like I did, you know, in my teenage, uh, early, early uh, adulthood. Some things I won't be able to do, but you know what I can do? I can try to direct my children and send them that way and say, hey, whatever I wasn't able to accomplish, you accomplish, right? Some of them might not, you know, hit that mark exactly like the other ones, you know, and you just keep on doing your, that after they leave the house, that arrow's been shot and it's like, well, that's up to you now, mm -hmm. right? When my kids leave the house, if I, if I don't do this, you remind me of this message, okay? My kids leave the house, they get married, whatever, they come back crying to mom and dad, oh man, that's yours. <laughs> that is your responsibility. Husband and wife fighting, hey, dad, I need you to come fix this situation. Nope, you go straighten that out with your husband. You know, you go straighten that out with your wife. You guys need to take care of that. You are the man of your own house, the woman of your own house. Now, arrows in the hands of a mighty man. And uh, so as a church, yeah, the only way we, at that age, they're adults. And we treat them just like everybody else, okay? But uh, isn't it a blessing to be in a church that has all different ages? I think it's great. And we need to work together on that and keep all those ages in mind. We're not just targeting one age group. I've heard a lot of people say, hey, whatever age you are as a pastor, usually the the congregation that you lead will pretty much take on those same characteristics. So if there's an older pastor, the the, the you know their way of thinking is, if you're an older pastor, you're pretty much going to have an older congregation. If you're a younger pastor, the kids and all that kind of stuff, you're going to have a congregation with well, I am, you know, not that old, and I'm in, in Iola, <laughs> leading a lot of people in their 70s, 80-year-old, 80-year-old. Look, you never know who's got, who God is going to give you to minister to, right. right? So we just, man, just have to come to everybody where they are to the best of our ability and deal with them on their different stage of life and have a general understanding of all different types of people, whether it's giving them the gospel, whether it's figuring out what they can do in the church, or whether it's just trying to teach them and, and, uh, and help them learn some things from the Bible. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you, church. Thank you, Lord, that the, for the majority of us in here anyway, that we've gone through these different uh, uh, stages of our life. And uh, now, Lord, we find ourselves uh, representing our own families and representing you as the head of our house, our houses. And Lord, I pray, Lord, for the younger people in here that are continuing to go through these stages, that you help them get through it. Help us be uh, uh, helpful to them however we can. And I pray, Lord, that you would just use us all for the work that you've called us to do and to do our parts as part of the body. And I pray that you'd be honored and glorified with what we'd accomplish uh, in your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.